What are Marian apparitions and why are they important? And do you need to believe in them the way you believe in divine revelation? I mean, just wait till you, you hear about Fatima and Lourdes Guadalupe today. I mean, this painting that you're looking at, it's of no known natural pigment. I mean, we're talking about a lot of witnesses here. It was like 40,000 people of every stripe, right? There were scientists that were there, medical doctors that were there, there were lawyers. The Lord is just giving us more than enough evidence for any reasonable, responsible person mm -hmm. to adhere to. Hey guys, welcome back to the Lila Rose podcast. I'm very excited that we've got the very wonderful Father Spitzer in studio today. So very happy you're back on today, Father Spitzer. Thanks for joining. Oh, it's really wonderful to be back with you again, Lila, and thank you for the opportunity. We're going to be talking about these controversial Marian uh, apparitions, which don't tune out if you're not Catholic and you're like, oh, well, I'm not Catholic. I don't know about this. I think the history about Marian apparitions, their impact in history, and just about Mary in general is hugely powerful, and I think everyone should know about it. So I'm very excited to have the expert here, Father Spitzer. Father, can you give a little bit of your background for people, though, that are just getting to know you? Well, um, I'm a Jesuit priest, so I'm celebrating my feast day today, St. Ignatius of Loyola, of course. And um, I um, uh, joined uh, the Society of Jesus in 1974 after graduating from college. And um, when I moved into the Society, I I'm always interested in science, always interested in uh, math, but also interested in business and leadership. So I've had a sort of a diverse background, but um, in my graduate studies, I uh, emphasized two areas, uh, New Testament scripture, uh, which I uh, took, um, uh, you know, a master's uh, a THM. Um, in, with a specialty in scripture, and then uh, um, from the Weston School uh, in Cambridge, Mass. And then I also uh, uh, studied uh, philosophy of science and did my doctorate in philosophy of science. Uh, specifically, my dissertation was on uh, time theory. Um, and um, of course, I do metaphysics, variety of other things. I uh, taught at uh, Georgetown University for a while. Uh, taught at um, Seattle University for a while and held the, the Frank Schrantz chair there and then taught uh, at Gonzaga University and but I was really the president of the university for 11 years. Uh, I um, uh, started the, uh, the Maja Center of Reason and Faith trying to put together uh, um, you know science with faith. I mean the, the complementarity is so awesome and um, you know people don't know that most scientists today are are theists or believers in God, mm -hmm. uh, they actually think the contrary. Mm -hmm. So uh, it might be nice to know just at the start that the Pew survey says uh, today that 51% uh, of scientists overall believe in God or a higher transcendent power. Only 21% are agnostic, 20% are atheists. Uh, but the young scientists, that's the most interesting statistic. 66%, uh, that's a supermajority, are believers in God or a higher transcendent power. Wow. And um, only 15% are um, uh, uh, agnostics and 15% atheists. And then the doctors, the physicians, are even more uh, interesting. Uh, the last survey um, was 76%, over three quarters, are believers in God mm -hmm. or a higher transcendent power. Uh, only, I believe it is 12.5% are agnostics, 11.2% are atheists. Today, you know, mm -hmm. science is no longer discrediting faith. Science is opening the door uh, to faith. So I've written about four new books um, uh, recently. Um, uh, the first book, um, Science at the Doorstep to God, um, which we've talked about here um, a little bit. Then Science, uh, I'm sorry, Christ, Science and Reason, mm -hmm. Um, which just came out two weeks ago from Ignatius. Then um, Science, Reason, and Faith, Discovering the Bible. Uh, we've talked about that a, a little bit here. And then now I'm doing also uh, the Science, Reason, and Faith Study Bible for OSV, which should be out in November. Father, your work is absolutely incredibly important. 
and you're just delightful to talk to <laughs> and you're a delightful read. So <laughs> I know the folks that haven't already met you who are listening now already find you delightful, I'm sure. <laughs> and so much wisdom that you have and so much experience because you've done, you've written, it's, you said 18 books now, you have four mm -hmm. new books you mentioned mm -hmm. and you've, you've become an expert on so much of this intersection of faith and reason and faith mm -hmm. and science. So today we're gonna be talking focusing on marrying apparitions. Yeah. There's so many other things we could be focused on because you're, there's so many much more to cover with you, but we're going to stick to the marrying apparitions for you today <laughs> because I, I think it's such a, I think so many people maybe misunderstand this aspect of Catholicism or orthodoxy. Yeah. And I I want to first start from the, the 100,000 foot view. What mm -hmm. are Marian apparitions? And well, why are they important? Yeah, well, and do you need to believe in them the way you believe in divine revelation? Uh, you know, that Jesus Christ was resurrected, or is there more to a Marian apparition than just pure belief? Yeah, so Marian apparitions, no, you do not need to believe in them uh, like you would like you know, divine scripture or a dogmatic proclamation of Christian doctrine. So um, you are free. Uh, uh, to say, I don't believe in them, I do believe in them, uh, as you wish. Uh, so there's no requirement that anyone believe in any specific apparition. I would say that there is very credible science-based evidence that every one of the three I'll be discussing to today, Guadalupe, um, uh, Fatima, and, and Lourdes, that there is very credible uh, and there are other ones too, but um, those are the three I'll take today. But there's very credible scientific evidence, but you do not have to believe in them. They are a visitation, uh, an apparition is a visitation from the Blessed Virgin Mary. Um, they comes to a specific person at a specific time. So, right, you're dealing with the, the, the movement in, in the Republic of France, for example, um, uh, in um, 1854, um, or you've got a secularist movement that's just trying to kill the church and uh, here comes the blessed virgin mary to this peasant rather uneducated she was the slowest girl in the class quote unquote according to some of her teachers and of course uh, bernadette subiru but mm -hmm. she's the one that the blessed virgin mary um, uh, appears to because she's very pure in heart and uh, i'll talk about that later but the main thing is it, it, we needed this uh, to happen at the time. And uh, of course, she reveals herself as the Immaculate Conception right in the middle of that miracle. Uh, Fatima, you've got this terrible war that's been, you know, I mean. What year is this? World War I, oh, 1917. Mm -hmm. And we're talking major bloodletting in World War I, right? These are the, over the trenches, right? You know, hundreds of thousands of people just dying day out, you know, gas attack, everything. It was a terrible, terrible bloodletting. And it was followed just because of the horrors of the trench warfare by the Spanish flu, uh, which was a terrible, probably killed about a third of the Earth's population. Um, you know, and Mary's there. She's uh, holding our hand. And I'll tell you that Fatima miracle had a huge difference to the maintenance of religious faith in Europe. Of course, there's a lot of secularism uh, going on at that time, a lot of masonry uh, that was opposed to Catholicism and in religion of you know the the Catholic persuasion at that time, so forth and so on. And so um, again, Mary is there. There's a reason. Uh, obviously, we see um, you know at the time when Guadalupe happens, uh, almost 500 years ago, right there, uh, what you're dealing with is frankly. Um, human sacrifice mm -hmm. and a variety of other things that uh, were just um, uh, in part of the native culture that was here. But uh, remarkably, this miracle uh, gets around and it becomes truly, uh, you know, integral to, um, uh, you know, religion and faith in Mexico. Mm -hmm. Now, somebody might say, well, why, did, why didn't Jesus appear? I mean, why Mary? I mean, you know, Mary is his mother, and that's a very nice thing, but uh, what has she got to do with it? Well, God has elevated Mary, I have to tell you, <laughs> to being an, uh, a, a, you know, a, a huge part, integral, to the economy of salvation. He, Jesus has elevated his own mother 
to being a part of the team, as it were, of, uh, you know, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit within the economy of salvation. She's going to have an active role. Well, why would they do that? I mean, gosh, they could do everything that Mary could do, obviously. So why pick Mary? Because Mary has a feminine voice. Mary has a feminine way. I can just tell you the times when we need a mother mm. uh, and men need a mother, not just women uh, want a mother. Men need a mother. I mean, even in war situations, you know, when all of a sudden, uh, you know, as some people, you know, tell these stories, you know, these Catholic guys start praying the Hail Mary and, uh, you know, uh, uh, in the middle of a terrifying situation. And the Protestant guys are saying it too, you know, there's just something about that motherly voice, mm -hmm. that motherly protection, that motherly comfort, you know, that's there. You, every boy remembers it, even though, of course, mm -hmm. they attach to their fathers, uh, you know, in, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, adult things, there is that almost instinctual, you know, you know, when you're, you're dying in a trench, what, who you're calling for? generally not your dad. You're calling for your mother. And so this is very normal. In fact, you know, the whole idea of a mother just being a part, you know, that like we, we don't have a sense as Catholics that it's God and us alone. Our whole soteriology, our, our view of salvation is family oriented. A big thank you to our partner, Hallow. Hallow is the number one prayer app on the globe. This app has thousands of prayers, guided meditations, scripture readings, and more for you to deepen your faith life. If you download Hallow today using the link in the description, you will get three months free. Their content doesn't just include prayers and scripture readings, but it also includes sleep stories to help you fall asleep and kids content so that you can listen to it with your kids in the car on the way to school or when you're running errands or whatever you're doing and they can grow in their faith too. The reason that Hallow is the number one prayer app because it's excellent content that is deeply rooted in your faith. Everything about Hallow is designed to create a deeper prayer experience for you in the busyness of your daily life. So go to the link in the description to download Hallow for free for three months to deepen your prayer life. From the get-go, from Jesus is not just his nativity, <clears throat> but from his, uh, his conception all the way through his nativity, all the way to this day, mm -hmm. we're being incorporated into a family. And that includes family love. That includes fatherly love. That includes motherly love. That includes brotherly love. That includes, of course, a divine component. And then, of course, the divinization, uh, as it were, of Mary's humanity, uh, not in the sense that she becomes... <laughs> A divine entity, but that she has that glorious uh, capacity and series of capacities, and her love is elevated to the point where she can share it with a myriad of people, right? <clears throat> All of that is part of our view of the way things are. I, I don't know about you, but in our house, when I was a little kid, we always had the crash set, and my mom, God bless her, you know, my mom would always point out the crash set and so forth. And I would look at that crash set, you know, when I was a little kid. And I just knew that was my family, too. Mm. Yes, of course, I loved our family and I felt part of our family. But the idea that, you know, heaven was like a family, that Mary was going to be there and Joseph was going to be there. And, you know, this whole idea of I'm part of of this family. I can sit at the dinner table, you know, like you know, my own family, or I could just be part of this communion of familial love. And you know how you can joke with your brothers and your sisters. And, you know, I mean, I'd always uh, joke with my mother. I'd say, trust me, mom. And she'd go, no, I can't trust you. <laughs> it's that tone of voice. <laughs> but anyway, the long and the short of it is there's such a familiarity, there's such an intimacy, a real emotional intimacy in family love. And so we don't have just this ray. Uh, it's not just an abstract relationship that we enter into, God and human beings, and we got this like <laughs> abstract relationship between us. It's a real family. It's a familial, intimate, emotionally intimate, generative relationship where we kind of can 
uh, love each other, kid each other, where affection is real, gentleness is real. And what's part of that family? I like hearing my mom's gentle mm -hmm. voice, but I also could hear my dad's voice like, uh, let me see if I have this right. <laughs> You're saying, and my dad, you know, had his, you know, way of making me be logical and so forth. Um, you know, that was a good thing for me, but it wasn't just his voice. It was my mom's voice, and I liked both voices, and I liked them to be together, and I liked, you know, being, uh, you know, with my brothers and sisters in that uh, way. We, we were like five kids in six and a half years, and like bugs in a rug. But, I mean, I'll tell you this. Uh, it was a really intimate thing, and I know when I look at that crescent or when I'm praying to Mary, I'm in the family. I'm at like the dinner table or like, you know, when you're at Christmas time and you're, you know, around the family and everybody's opening a present here and there and everybody's happy and you're sharing, you know, the whole intimacy um, of, of each person's happiness and not just that, but just going to mass together. And <laughs> I think a lot of evangelicals, yeah. Uh, what you're saying re would resonate with them. I know being raised in the evangelical church, mm -hmm. I was, you know, there was a sense like we are the community of believers. There's a lot of emphasis on community. You have your pastors, your mentors, your elders, and all of this. I think the, the biggest hang up maybe for Protestants or one of the biggest challenges, and I'd love your response mm -hmm. on this, and then we're going to get to Guadalupe, yeah. uh, Lourdes, <laughs> okay. and Fatima, because they're incredibly important and fascinating for us to know about, uh, all people mm -hmm. to know about. But I think one of the biggest hangups is this idea of praying to the dead, because there's this particular prohibition in the Old Testament to prayers to the dead. Um, it's sort of like invoking a kind of witchcraft of sorts. And so this fear that, well, if we ask for Mary's prayers, she is dead. Yes, she's in heaven, but she's, you know, dead on earth. And mm -hmm. so therefore, it's a violation of the Old Testament uh, and God's law to be asking the dead for prayers. That's like a pagan thing. Yeah. Um, when you're, uh, of course, there's no question about it. You know, you should not be speaking with the dead or certainly not, um, uh, in, in a sense, praying to the dead for something uh, where you're not sure of what the disposition of that person is. However, we're very certain of what the disposition of a whole lot of other people are, right? So in other words, uh, we're very, we're very sure that Christ's mother is in heaven. So that's an unquestioned fact, and it's not just dogmatic, but if God selected Mary to be the mother of his son, all I can tell you is... Uh, She's she in a good not, retirement home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One of the best. <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. So she's very well taken care of with her son. And as I said, we certainly believe she's a huge part of the economy of salvation by God's will. He wanted her voice, mm -hmm. her feminine voice, her motherly protection, her motherly love, that gentleness of spirit, that power of the gentleness and intimacy of the Hail Mary to come into our lives of you know, of, of course, transcendent power. You know, I, you don't have to be sappy. Uh, we still need a mom. Mm. And uh, we need a, a salvific mom. And I surely do. And it makes a huge difference in my spirituality. But getting back there. So we, of course, you know, I, I will say, hey, Lila, pray for me. I got this thing coming up. And we, we even just say this as a matter of course. I mean, if you look at all of the graffiti on the walls, um, like in Rome, for example, mm -hmm. you go to where the tomb of St. Peter is. And it, it was his uh, uh, bones were initially stored in a wall underneath what we call the Scavi today, uh, underneath St. Peter's. There's an area there, the Scavi. And you can see on that wall, you know, St. Peter, pray for me. Mm -hmm. St. Paul, pray for me. You can all, you know, see all From of 2,000 years ago or 15 Yes, years. no, this would be like almost at the time wow. of Peter's death because he was buried outside the Vatican walls because he was um, obviously uh, considered like a criminal. So he was executed, mm -hmm. but he was buried outside um, of Rome in the area of the Vatican, mm -hmm. uh, the, the Roman walls in the Vatican area. And uh, we notice, uh, too, um, there that, um, you know, there's like an iconography that's already springing up around mm -hmm. that. But this graffiti is almost back to the one the first century uh, for sure, because Peter was, you know, obviously uh, killed around 64 A.D. 
um, probably crucified upside down in the Circus Maximus, and then mm. the bones were uh, transferred there. But you the, clearly pray for me, mm. you know, is there. Peter, pray for me. Paul, pray for me. And, uh, you know, one of the earliest icons we have is an icon of Mary above Peter and Paul, and she is above them pointing down at them. So this, you know, the idea that somehow Marian apparitions, uh, you know, and Marian um, uh, participation in the economy of salvation or Mary's huge part in the communion of saints, um, you know, uh, came about by an over-exercised church, you know, in the, uh, you know, 11th century or something is completely nonsense. I mean, it's, it's, uh, you know, uh, certainly a part of the church from the very earliest times. And so, of course, we see images of Mary all over the place and, you know, like scratched images and, and so forth all over the place in the church. So the idea of being prayed for by the saints, that's a first century deal. And so we ought to take note of that. You know, this is only like 30 years after, you know, Jesus maybe died around 32 or um, uh, maybe 33. Uh, Peter 64 is not, you know, 64, uh, I mean, uh, 30 years. Uh, and already, you know, the, the, it's clear uh, that this practice of, of being prayed for by the saints is mm -hmm. there. And so why would we deny it? You know, this is, they were the closest ones to Christ. You know, if Peter and Paul themselves before their deaths were sanctioning it, why wouldn't we, you know, the, the sanctioning the prayers of the, of the martyrs? So, I mean, this is uh, as ancient as it comes. So that's the first thing. But again, ontologically, what could be wrong with asking for the prayers of somebody who you are certain is in heaven and who you are certain is part of the economy of salvation by God's own design, why would you say, don't do it? Mm. I mean, why would you undercut, you know, her, you know, like I said, motherly, her familial, uh, you know, presence uh, in your own spiritual life? And by the way, her powerful intercession uh, we don't worship Mary. We ask for her intercession. We ask for her help because she is part of the economy of salvation. And Mary is very active. I mean, there's just no question. I mean, if you've ever been in deliverance ministry, she's mm -hmm. always showing up. Well, and, and she, these apparitions we're going to get into. Yep. She's showing up in human history, not yes. just in our prayers, but in literal human history. We have three apparitions we were going to unpack, and mm -hmm. you're going to talk us through Guadalupe, yep. Lourdes, and Fatima. Mm -hmm. And we have about an hour plus ish. Which one should we start with, Father? Let's start uh, with the What's oldest your one, Guadalupe. Oh, okay. oh, my favorite? Well, oh, maybe that's a dangerous yeah, question. Yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> I'd probably go with Fatima, but I'm, I'm not going to do that. I'll go with Guadalupe because um, it, it is the oldest one, and um, it's our North American. Appearance. I mean, our uh, uh, our um, American appearance, and so I I probably you know she's right between North and South America, you and know. she's very They're, special here too because we're obviously in Southern California, and so she was a hop and a skip down the down the continent where she appeared. You're going to tell us that, and the set mm -hmm. actually is a little bit drawing on her for inspiration. We've got stars here on set. The blue, oh, her mantle splendid. is blue, yeah. so. Tell us about Our Lady of Guadalupe, the history there. Yeah, well, of course, in the 1500s, she's, um, you know, Mary uh, 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 appears to uh, Juan Diego. He's uh, an Indian um, who's uh, um, pretty much a, a very pure-hearted Indian, but not, uh, a, you know, he's, he's poor. I mean, he's uneducated, and, and you know, it's typical of what Mary does. I mean, Christ comes you know, in poverty. And, mm -hmm. and Mary likes to appear to people who are generally uneducated and poor, um, because, of course, God leaves no one out. And, of course, uh, uh, you know, I think it's beautiful. I love it. He, you know, he loves everybody equally. And uh, so he appears uh, to Juan Diego, uh, or she appears, excuse me, to Juan Diego, and um, she says, Juan Diego, I'd like you to go to 
uh, Bishop Z Z Zumaraga, I, I think is the proper pronunciation. I always say Zumaraga. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, he, uh, he goes, uh, you know, um, over there and says, well, Bishop, I was asked by the, this uh, lady on the hill, uh, Tepeyac Hill, I was asked, to, you know, to come here and ask you for uh, to build a church up there on the hill to uh, in her honor. And the bishop goes, right. Uh, he says, I don't think I'm going to do that, um, but uh, thanks anyway. So, of course, Juan Diego, he goes uh, uh, back and forth. Uh, you know, he had a sick uncle, and uh, Mary um, he heals her. That's the first miracle of Guadalupe, uh, heals the, uh, the sick uncle. But, of course, uh, he goes back up and tells her, well, I didn't like it, and he wants some kind of proof. You know that if if you really are who you say you uh, uh, you might be, or is implied you might be, then he needs proof. And she goes, "Okay, we'll come back here, uh, you know, uh, tomorrow, and I'll give you the proof you want right here at the hill." So his his uncle gets sick, and so Juan Diego tries to avoid her. You know, so he goes, he tries to go around the hill in order to get a doctor to bring back to his uncle, and uh, hopes that she won't notice him. But of course, she notices him, so she kind of meets him in his little short, his little long cut, you know, as he's trying to his, get around her, and uh, she says, "Oh, you know, and uh, you know, Juanito, you know, um, affectionate name, you know, what are you doing?" And of course, you know, he, oh, you know, caught. So she, uh, uh, she um, says, uh, "Are you worried about?" This? He says, "Yeah, my uncle is sick and he's going to die, and I need a doctor and." You know, I, I, I wanted to come back, but I can't do it. She goes, don't worry. Just trust me. Your uncle's going to be just fine. So um, he goes, okay. Um, uh, of course, as you, um, I think most people know, he goes up to the hill and he sees all of these Castilian roses that are there. He doesn't know they're Castilian roses, but they are. But he's never seen these beautiful flowers before. So he, you know, he has a tilma, which sort of drapes over the front part of, and the back part of you, but the part that drapes over the front, he gathers all the uh, Castilian roses and he puts them in front of him, and then um, uh, he uh, um, carries them over to the uh, uh, cathedral, you know, where the bishop is with his retinue, and I can tell you how many people are there, and I'll talk about why that is in a moment, but he... Uh, uh, the bishop says, oh, you know, he's gathered there with the retinue. And uh, he says, uh, so, uh, you know, what is the sign? And he just drops his tilma, and all these Castilian roses fall on the ground. That did it. Why, I mean, why Castilian? What's oh, significant about that? Oh, it's from Spain, that? and, he, and uh, the Zumarga was from Spain. Wow, so he recognized them. He recognized right away, and he knew that they were not indigenous uh, to, you know, um, Mexico. Wow. So he, 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 you know, he was wide eyed, but he's even more wide eyed because when he drops the, uh, the tilma, they're emblazoned on the tilma. And I'll tell you how remarkable this is in a moment is a picture of Our Lady and she's looking out um, <clears throat> and you, and we'll see that she's actually looking at all of them. So, he, she, you know, uh, she's got herself, you know, placed sort of looking even at Juan Diego, uh, you know, showing his tilma. So she's a little far off uh, in the corner there, and she's elevated up about three feet. But anyway, she, she's there, and you just see um, this beautiful woman. She looks like, um, uh, you know, a native uh, Indian, um, but uh, her features uh, you know, are truly youthful, innocent. She's um, pregnant um, in the symbolism of her pregnancy, not just the dissension of the abdomen, but the, the um, you know, the, uh, you know, the symbols of, of, and the sash and so forth uh, of pregnancy are there. She also, of course, is, is uh, wearing a, a, a sort of a, a native, you know, um, uh, looking um, uh, a set of clothes, and she's got, you know, not only a, a typical, uh, you know, uh, um, beautiful clothing, but she's got a, a, a cape on her, you know, that uh, is uh, filled with stars that we'll talk about in a moment. But the long and the short of it is uh, there's this uh, picture emblazoned on 
and, and it's clearly a work of art. Uh, and you, you cannot know how much it is a work of art until, you know, I, I, I explain this. But it's a work of art. And everybody there uh, who is European knows that this is the product of a master. And, and so they're just stunned by the, uh, the, the both the tilma and by the, uh, um, uh, the, the roses, the Castilian roses. And so, of course, as you probably know, the bishop goes in and builds this um, uh, church uh, on Tepeyac Hill uh, to the Blessed Virgin Mary and puts the tilma there, um, you know, to, uh, as, as a sign of the appearance of the Virgin. Well, there's all this um, uh, imagery that, you know, for the native people is well known that's in the, uh, in the tilma itself, which we can uh, explain too. But the main thing is, is that it becomes a source of conversion uh, to Christianity. And um, even that itself is a miracle. Good Ranchers delivers some of the best beef, poultry, and pork directly to your door, directly from farmers and ranchers in the United States. I love Good Ranchers because it's American meat delivered and the meat is delicious, especially the chicken. I love the chicken breasts. GoodRanchers.com has an amazing promotion going on right now where if you sign up for a subscription box and you use the code Lila, you get $25 off your box, you get free fast shipping, and you get to add on a free delicious product of chicken breast, bacon, ground beef, or salmon. So go to GoodRanchers.com today, support your local ranchers, and partner with a company that supports your pro-life and pro-family values. And use the code Lila at checkout for $25 off your first subscription order, in addition to free shipping and your free selection of ground beef, chicken breasts, those are my favorite, salmon or bacon. Go to GoodRanchers.com today and enjoy delicious American meat delivered. You mentioned there's obviously this bishop, and it sounds like Juan Diego already had a relationship with the church. He was Catholic. But what was mm -hmm. the what was going on at the time of the apparition well, in it, what is now modern-day Mexico? Well, you know, you had um, uh, three native uh, religions, uh, the, the, uh, um, which, you know, actually had integral to them human sacrifice. And, of course, the deities were, uh, we would say, some of them were uh, quite demonic, you know, in terms of their thirst for blood and things. So this was that. happening at the time of the apparition. They were doing human yes. sacrifice. Oh, yes. The Aztecs and oh, other yes. indigenous groups. Oh, oh, absolutely. And not only that, but, you know, other uh, things and, you know, those, uh, uh, you know, the d dimensions of d almost demonic dimensions uh, of, of some of this uh, religious practice were very obvious. And there was a... Uh, an incredible turning from these Aztec religions to uh, essentially Christianity and, uh, you know, an abandonment of the human sacrifice and other kinds of things. And that included, you know, uh, you know, offering up one's children, you know, for uh, various, uh, you know, fertility or other kinds of things, you know, to, uh, you know, food or, uh, you know, expiation and things of that nature. All of that changed in a relatively short period of time, right? The, a matter of a couple of decades, uh, this stuff is erratic. I think that's really the true miracle. And it, it is so much at the center of things that um, this, this image itself, the tilma itself, um, becomes a real source of conversion, ongoing conversion, and greatly increasing conversion over the decades and centuries. So there were some Spanish uh, missionaries in Mexico at the time, mm -hmm. and the bishop you mentioned was there. What was the sort of political dynamic of some of the first Christians who came to the Central America? And then how was their work improved, or how did they make more, how were they more effective after the apparition of Our Lady of Guadalupe? Yeah, I think the image itself uh, you know, the idea of a almost like a malevolent God, you know, a God who really, uh, um, you know, is bloodthirsty, desires uh, blood and, uh, and uh, a variety of other things. Um, you know, th that image of God, just by the feminine character of uh, the image of Mary, is, is transformed. And, of course, her words to Juan Diego were also carefully recorded. You know, the uh, symbolism in the picture itself is also manifesting 
a sense of love, a sense of a gentleness in divinity, things that we take for granted as being readers of the New Testament and looking at, you know, the father of the prodigal son, for example, as a mm. as a uh, an image of who the father is. This is not known, uh, you know, in Mexico. In fact, the, uh, the image of God is almost in many ways uh, <clears throat> oppositional uh, to the father of the prodigal son. So <clears throat> Mary and her image just enables this uh, to be transitioned very, very quickly. And that is, <clears throat> it's not just moving uh, a populace toward Christianity, it's moving a populace toward this idea of a divine family into which we're incorporated, you know, a family which is good and affectionate and gentle, just like we were just talking about. And more than that, <clears throat> that it uh, actually transitions them from much more of a you know a, a god of power and a god of blood, uh, basically uh, to a god of love and a god who loves the poor and a god who would you know see every poor person as being of you know almost infinite significance, being bo made in the image and likeness of Him. You know, I mean, obviously they're not infinite ontologically, but uh, of infinite significance, surely, because we have those transcendental desires for perfect truth, love, goodness, beauty, and home built right into our souls. So you look at that and you can see that, you know, there is almost a civilizing influence. And Mary always had a civilizing influence on religion, certainly uh, in, in the Middle Ages, you know, that idea of, you know, uh, the knightly code, yes, but the idea that I I intrinsic to the divine family uh, is Mary and and how that image of her takes the, uh, um, the idea of God and integrates into it, um, <clears throat> you know, a kind of gentleness and, a, you know, a love that is not just maternal, it's, it's a love that um, you know, that, uh, that is side by side with the loving paternity of God so that people could see God's paternity not as bloodthirsty, but God's paternity as generative and loving and intimate. So um, that's pretty much um, a fact. I, I must say there are all kinds of other things that happen along with it. I mean, uh, obviously there were a lot of people who later wanted to destroy that image because it was so influential. It kept everybody in the faith. And one guy actually put a, a, a terrorist, put a bomb underneath the image, unprotected by glass or anything like that, and uh, uh, well, blew out windows. And there's, actually, there was a big, you know, a bronze cross, huge bronze cross, and it just pulled that thing right back, you know, like a big giant upside down U, you know, and it just, blew that thing, uh, you know, right backward. And you look at that, and Mary is completely untouched. <laughs> now, just being a guy who likes physics and who <laughs> studies explosions with some degree of fascination, that's not possible. Wow. <laughs> I mean, how could this unprotected tilma being made of cactus fabric? Let me tell you, I could, do you, should I, I tell just... Maybe ten things about this Tilma that'll blow you away. I can't wait. Away. I can't wait to be blown away hearing about the ten things <laughs> of the Tilma. I have a quick question though. Sure. She was pregnant. You said in the image. Yes. And my understanding is this is one of the only, if not the only, apparition, Marian apparition that she's obviously pregnant. Mm -hmm. Is that true? Yes. So and she doesn't usually appear pregnant, Mary. She Why does was not. it so significant for Mary to appear pregnant to Juan Diego at this time in human history, and? Why was it also significant for her to be dressed the way she was and presenting ethnically the way that she was? Yeah, I would. Uh, this is, you know, again, uh, uh, Father Spitzer interpretation, right? That's my favorite so, kind. Yeah. Let's do it. <laughs> so uh, uh, this is not definitive by the church or anything else. But in my view, um, you know, there's, uh, of course, these f fertility cults that are uh, always omnipresent, you know, wherever you have. Um, you know, um, non-Christian religions and things. Well, of course, Mary um, just replaces all of that 
but replaces it in a way that it is not a superstitious thing that mm. she you know you know has this uh um you know dimension but for me my personal interpretation is that this is the image of a mother who is part of a family and so i believe that this is putting the family smack dab in the middle of things and saying this family is exceedingly important what's important you know of course you know having a warrior like spirit uh when you're at war is important and so forth and so on but the family is integral to everything the family is the building block of the church everybody in the family you know deserves to be respected as being honored and made in the image and likeness of God. Mm -hmm. So all of these images are going forth. And Mary wants uh, to say, you know, that who who's in her womb, right? It's Jesus. That's the one in the womb. And so, of course, Jesus, you know, he is there as a little baby in every, you know, in the, in the image of, of the uh, Tilma itself. Of course, you don't see him. Uh, inside the womb, but he's there in the womb, and he's part of this image, and he's the savior of the world. He is the one that is to come. And of course, in these mythologies, there are, you know, these mother figures that uh, bring, um, you know, uh, someone akin to the heroic savior into the world. Uh, Jesus, of course, is a messianic and loving savior who uh, brings his self-sacrificial act into the world to defeat um, evil by his self-sacrificial love. So that, um, you know, part of it has to be explained and unraveled. But uh, that pregnancy is really important uh, because, of course, it's, it's putting the family in the center of things. It's replacing any kind of this fertility interpretation of things and really saying that this belongs, this, uh, you know, um, you know, ch children belong within the family. They should all be respected within the family. And the person that Mary's carrying is not just anybody, it's Jesus. It's not just a heroic savior. It is literally this messianic, self-sacrificial, loving savior. And everything about that picture exudes love. There's the highest commandment, you know, and that charitable love, that agape love, that self-sacrificial love. And if you're looking at those eyes, I'll, I'll tell you the, about that painting in a moment, but it exudes love. Well, in the time, not... it, like you said, the time it came into the world, she appeared was during a time of the sacrifice, human oh, sacrifice, yeah. including the sacrifice of children. Oh, yeah. And then you have, I mean, North America, America particularly, exporting abortion in the last century in this global mm -hmm. Uh, infanticide, uh, feticide, killing babies in the womb. There's now mm -hmm. billions of abortions globally over the last couple decades. Mm -hmm. And I just think about, but America has been a huge source of that error uh, yeah. to spread and export abortion as well as committing it here. And I just think about her radically countercultural message, both for the Aztecs and for the modern day Americans to say, here I am, the mother of God, with God in my womb, to show you love and to show you the gift that a child is, and this is your savior. It is extraordinarily countercultural and, and necessary for us to see that, hear that message. Oh, yeah. In fact, there's two sets of images in her eyes, if uh, Dr. Jose Astetansman is correct, and one of that's right in the pupil area. On of, the tilma. Uh, th this is in the tilma. And if you, you know, there's obviously there's an image that's uh, around the iris area. So you have a, you can get reflections in the cornea. And the reflection in the cornea is the image of what's happening there when Mary is looking at the scene of Juan Diego revealing his tilma and the roses. So that um, is kind of in the, uh, in the iris area, but in the middle, in the pupil area, the corneal reflection, very minute, is of a Mexican family. Wow. Um, and uh, again, there is the family image and, you know, the preciousness of the child within the family, the preciousness of the family itself. This is at the center of the Christian religion. This is at the center of Christian love. And that message, you know, symbolically is writ large 
um, on the tilma. Tell me the 10 things about the tilma that we should know, the miraculous yeah. things, too. Uh, these are just, and we've known these for a long time. First, uh, you know, the agave, um, uh, the, like a cactus fiber tilma. Uh, the normal lifespan of that is about 30 years. Uh, certainly after 60 years, uh, it'll almost be in a state of complete disintegration. Here's a tilma that is 500 years old, and it's just fine. There's hardly any decomposition in it at all. Utterly baffling from an organic chemistry point of view. This should not happen. This should be long gone 450 years ago. But it wasn't. It's here. And it is almost in pristine condition. That's the first thing. The second thing to notice is that the tilmas... You know, now some things were added to the tilma later, like the rays that are coming out of Mary and the moon with the angels under her feet and so forth. So the Revelations 12 images, right? Those things were added They later. painted on it. They painted it Why? On. Why did they do that? Uh, they wanted it to make her the woman clothed with the mm -hmm. sun from Revelations uh, 12, I believe it is. And so then you've got that... Um, there for catechetical purposes. But you, if you look at where the things are painted on, chipping, all kinds of, you know, the, the, the brilliance of the color is completely, you know, diminished. And on top of that, you, you really do have decomposition of paint, not just chipping and, and flecking and, and so forth, but you actually have, um, you know, decomposition uh, of, the, of, the, um, of the paint. Whereas where the blessed virgin is right so the original picture not the ones with the additions the original picture no decomposition mm -hmm. no diminishment in the brilliance of the colors whatsoever so it's like huh uh, uh, how do you get this um it, 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 really that should also be in a state of uh, similar decomposition to the paint but it is not again nobody knows how this can be Number three, what's really interesting, again, is there is this painting that you're looking at of the Blessed Virgin, not the additions, but the actual, um, I will call it uh, the image instead of a painting, because it's not paint, per se, but it's of no known natural pigment. And of course, there weren't any synthetic pigments at the time of uh, Mary's appearance. So what does that mean? Well, nobody can explain it. Where did these pigments come from? Because they are vastly different from any natural pigment. That's the third thing. The fourth thing is, is anybody who's an artist knows the first thing you have to do is treat a canvas before you paint on it. Because if you don't treat a canvas, of course, all the irregularities and the wrinkles and everything in the canvas, it's going to show up and it's going to wreck the picture. So you got to do some you know, preparation of the, the, of the canvas. Well, there is no preparation of this canvas of any kind. There's no uh, varnishes that were used. There was no, uh, you know, um, you know uh, stretching of the canvas uh, to make it regular and then, you know, followed up by uh, varnishings of certain kinds. Nothing was used. It's just a plain old agave tilma. Um, and it's not even a canvas. It's an irregular agave tilma, right? Cactus fiber tilma, uh, very much less desirable for painting than uh, a, a canvas. So the main thing is, is it's bizarre. There's been no preparation, um, you know, of the, uh, of, of the actual uh, tilma itself uh, for a painting that's going to go on there. Boy, it gets much, much more interesting. Then, of course... Um, you know, um, normally people have under sketching, right? Uh, they, they kind of try and paint, uh, not paint, but to sketch various kinds of images so they can a actually, you know, put the, the, uh, the paint onto it. But um, under infrared analysis, there is no under sketching of any kind. Or, no, there is where the additions were made, but where the actual image of Our Lady is, no. No under sketching of any kind. Oh, then of course you look at it and you go, "Hey, there's something, um, you know, uh, interesting here." There's no brush strokes. Now, as I said, 
any kind of painting's got some brush strokes. If it's painted, it's painted generally with a brush, which is a, the best uh, means of getting the paint on there. How would you, without any brush or you know tool of application, get that paint so perfectly on that tilma without that brush or other you know tool of application? <laughs> I do not know, but it's not there. And you can show that. So infrared analysis, by the way, shows the lack of uh, understanding. But what's really bizarre about just, you know, the production of the painting itself, is you can see the fullness of Our Lady's lips, right? Well, what's causing that uh, fullness of her lips is the fact that there are cactus fibers, irregular cactus fibers, which are protruding from the tilma, that actually conform to her lips and bring the fullness of her lips and the fullness of her cheek is again, and the, uh, the, the, uh, the depth of the eyes is all brought out by irregular, I mean, non-systematic, non-patterned cactus fiber protrusions. Now, you know, every artist who has looked at this has said, this is not possible to do humanly. You, you can't, you know, without... Well, you it's just, like those images of, like, this banana looks like yeah. a human face, you know? Yeah, or, like, yeah. you like you see, like, this apple core looks like, yeah. you know, a giraffe or whatever. Yeah. Like, there's funny images, but they're always kind of a little goofy, and they're like, oh, I can kind of see it if I squint. Yeah. But this is way this beyond is that. This is, like, way beyond it. I mean, it's literally as if the picture were built around the irregularities of the protruding cactus fibers. I'm Incredible. Not you. I mean, who can do this? What artist can do this? So most, you know, artists, there's a very good, um, um, uh, uh, Daniel, uh, Daniel Castellano has put together a website on the um, image of Our Lady. Of, it's a historiographical, very good scholarly historiographical website, free of charge. And he's got um, like three of his, of his episodes out of 14 are devoted to, um, uh, you know, describing this image and interviewing all these painters and who just go, uh, I, I could never do it. I don't know of anybody in the contemporary era who could do it, blah, 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 blah. But it gets even weirder. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm not kidding you. This, this painting is so irregular, so scientifically uh, inexplicable, naturalistically inexplicable. Okay, so, um, you know, there's a thing called an ophthalmoscope. And basically an ophthalmoscope, you can actually use it uh, to, to discover, you know, the depth of the retina. But the main thing that, um, you know, uh, you have is when you're using an ophthalmoscope, you have various lenses with various focal lengths. So once you have the right focal length, then you can get a reflection um, from the uh, uh, from the back of the retina uh, all the way to the ophthalmoscope. Well, if you apply the ophthalmoscope to Our Lady's eyes, what you wind up seeing is actual depth in her retinas. Hmm. But this painting is painted on a flat, opaque surface. I mean, again, just being a guy who's interested in optics, that's not possible. I do not know, but if you take a lens with the wrong, with a wrong focal length and you put it into the ophthalmoscope right at the center where her retina should be reflecting the greatest depth, no light will come from, uh, will reflect back. You put the right focal length, it reflects back, just like a genuine human wow. retina. I mean, it's like... How does this happen on a painting with a flat, opaque surface? Answer, no naturalistic explanation I know of. Yet, um, uh, that's, oh, it gets weirder. I mean, now you, you've got these images that are on, like I was just talking about, the corneal reflections on the image. And, and if you, you know, like if you look at my um, eyes and you had proper optical equipment to examine my eyes, you would see that my image of you, if, um, you know, reflected in my corneas, has what's called the sanson uh triple reflection. So you'd have a, a large regular right side up image, a smaller, as you're going around the curvature of the retina, smaller uh, um, right side up, and then finally an upside down small 
image mm -hmm. in the corner, you know, that that takes on the curvature of the retina accordingly. That happens in every human eye. There's a triple reflection. Well, there is one image that is very clear um, in her, um, reflected on her corneas that people have seen without any special magnification or, you know, computerized enhancement and, and all of that stuff. And uh, we thought for a long time it was Juan Diego, but now it looks like it was a Spaniard, uh, you know, who was invited to the court. He's stroking his beard, you know, looking at this image. He's very curious, uh, but it is not Juan Diego. Uh, we, we can see Juan Diego in other images. But the main thing is, you know, going all the way back to 1954, without special equipment, you can see the sense and uh, Prakinci triple reflection, you know, literally reflected in the corneas of Our Lady's eyes. Wow. Now, who in the 1500s, let me see now, who could have done that? Who could have even remotely, I mean, you know, I mean, this is like, yes, it is a very large image, and she does have, you know, sort of, you know, eyes like your eyes around the size of your eyes. But, I mean, uh, reflecting a uh, triple uh, reflection, nobody knew about that. And, and in any case, it, it, the triple reflection comes, it's exactly what it should be to reflect the curvature of the cornea. And all you can do is just go, uh, impossible that this be done. Even today, <clears throat> with computer calculations, no way. So, I mean, to, to, to duplicate this, oh, but it gets even weirder. Everylife.com is America's fastest growing baby diaper company. I love everylife.com because they not only make amazing products, these diapers are leak proof with great quality materials, but this is also a diaper that is made with love by a pro-life company that is giving back to the pro-life movement. So when you go to everylife.com, you set up your diaper subscription for that little one in your life that you love. You're not only getting an amazing product for your little one, but you're also supporting the pro-life movement. Did you know that companies, unfortunately like Pampers and Huggies, are owned by conglomerates that actually are pro-abortion, that donate money to groups like Planned Parenthood? Not so with everylife. Everylife.com is not only a best-in-class product for babies, but it also also loves babies and supports babies by supporting the pro-life movement. So go to everylife.com today, order your diapers and wipes subscription or gift a friend who might need diapers and wipes for their little one and use the code Lila at checkout for 10% off your order. That's everylife.com and use the code Lila at checkout for 10% off your order. Oh, but it gets even weirder. Now um, there's this uh, fellow, Dr. Jose um, Oste Tonsman. Uh, and he was basically, you know, I think he did his um, doctorate in optics and for NASA. Uh, I think it was Columbia. Um, anyway, some, uh, no, it was Cornell uh, at Cornell. And uh, he did his Ph.D. there. But anyway, uh, you know, he used to do computer enhancements of, you know, um, you know, interstellar and and. Uh, and uh, long distant objects uh, in outer space. And one of the techniques you can use uh, to amplify images or parts of images so that you can get a really you know, amplified or enhanced image is you can pixelate it, right? Mm -hmm. So let's say you break it up into 100,000 little dots. Now you can actually measure the light reflected in those 100,000 dots, right? So you know, proportionately, fractionally, right? You know how much light is in this little pixelated piece compared with this pixelated piece compared with this little pixelated piece over 100,000 pixelated pieces or whatever it is. Then all you need to do is multiply that by 2,500. Now, of course, you need a computer to do this. Uh, and then you just, so the light um, reflection magnification that, um, you know, if you, uh, Jose Yaste Thompson, uh, I believe he did it 2,500 times um, amplification. So he really expanded that. And so you can see, you know, um, as you put each one of those pl pieces in place, what becomes very, very apparent is that there is not just an image of this one Spaniard stroking his beard. You can definitely see... Um, uh, Archbishop Zumar, uh, Zumaraga, you can see him 
you know, kind of leaning back, you know, he's got a high forehead, he's got, you know, the Franciscan robe on and so forth and so on. You can see him very clearly. You can see his translator nearby who's kind of uh, whispering something into uh, his ears. You can see a, a, a native who's uh, sitting down there, um, you know, and looking at the whole scene. You see um, a native as well on the other side, maybe a servant girl or something who is uh, standing there as well. And you see Juan Diego, clear as a bell, with his tilma, uh, you know, extending outward and, of course, uh, with the roses dropping. You can see this whole scene um, that's there. Now, of course, some people say, oh, you know, you expand that thing by 2,500 times. It's just cloud gazing, you know. You can make anything out of, you know, it that you want to make out of it. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, not so fast. What Oste Tonsman did was he basically showed, okay, there's going to be real um, differences between the left cornea and the right cornea. So you would have to know the curvature of that cornea and the exact tilt of the Blessed Virgin's head because that would make angular differentiation you Whoa. know, between the two eyes and so forth. So Oste Tonsman gets a bunch of algorithms together, right, where he can actually take an image and finally transpose it. So you, if you get the curvature right in both eyes, you got the tilt of her head. Remember, she's elevated up there about three feet looking down, so there's a tilt going forward to the head. So Oste Tonsman takes all of those differences and calculates all the algorithms in order to make a transposition. Now... You know, obviously, you're going to catch some stuff in the left um, eye, right? At the at this end of the left eye, you're going to see some stuff that the right um, extreme uh, corner in the, of the right cornea can't see and vice versa. So you'll get some new stuff, uh, you know, that's there. But if you, you know, both eyes. Now, if you look at that and you put in all of the angular differentiation all the optical differentiation, all the curvature differentiation, you put them all into the algorithms, you can then look at and compare, almost like you're transposing the image from the left eye and it will fit like a glove right onto the right cornea of the Blessed Virgin. Insane. So, uh, you know, I have a, um, I can send this to you if you want to post it on your, um, you know, a website, <laughs> but I can send you that transposition, you know, because wow. Oste Tonsman provided the video of it. So you can actually see the left one going over to the right one. And as it fits on there, wow, it enhances, um, you know, the, uh, the image um, uh, clarity much, much more. I mean, you know, there's no way this is cloud gazing. And by the way, because all of the irregularities in the eyes, right, you'd think there'd be different irregularities in cloud gazing between the left cornea and the right cornea. Well, there are those irregularities turn out to be regularities. Send it to me, Father Schuster. We'll put yeah. it in. We'll put it in the locals community oh, okay. that we have, and also the website of the other. There was another website. Daniel did, uh, Castellano. Daniel Castellano's website. So. We'll include that too. All for our locals. Oh yeah. Well, anyway, to make a long story short, I mean, I mean, it is so clear. What you're seeing is the Blessed Virgin Mary. She mm -hmm. is producing an image of herself on the tilma of her. Remember, she's not um, um, behind Juan Diego. She's in front of him, so she's looking at the whole group. Juan Diego is kind of in the middle showing his uh, tilma and she's looking at him from the side showing the tilma to the rest of the group so you look at that and i'm telling you she's elevated about three feet up there her head is uh, tilted slightly to the left you can see the forward tilt of uh, you know uh, that's there and you put all of this stuff together and i'm not kidding you it is there right uh, those images are there you can see what zumaraga zumaraga looks like and by the way you can take 
that double one where he's got the left cornea superimposed on the right cornea, you can take that double image and you can look at a portrait that was painted of Zumaraga, several of them. It's him with the high forehead and with the hair, do, I mean, not the, you know, the, the, the Franciscan shamazel, the Franciscan beard and, and the Franciscan mm -hmm. um, uh, garments and so forth. So you can see this very clearly. It's Juan Diego, all right. You can tell he's got the tilma on. And of course, uh, uh, you can see um, uh, the Spaniard, oh, as clear as day, who's stroking his beard, the native girl, um, uh, the native uh, um, uh, man, like, a, uh, uh, like a, almost an Indian native who's sitting down and crossing his legs. You can see the entire scene very, very clearly um, there, uh, along with the translator and so forth. So um, it's like it just comes alive. And uh, all I can tell you is, no possible way do we have the technology right now to do a, you know a, a, a complete perfect corneal reflected image that you know reflects the Sanson Prakenji uh, triple reflection plus the actual uh, main imaging from the left to the right uh, corneas. I mean it's spect spectacular. And so all I can say is uh, you don't think this image is miraculous? I'll tell you if the more you look at this, and the more I uh, read that book by Oste Tonsman, too, he's very uh, humble. And all I would say is um, it, it's a miracle. <laughs> it's a miracle. Did we do all 10, Father Spitzer? Yeah. So well that, done. Yeah. Well done. Wow. That was a blast. Yeah. That was amazing. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll leave it at that. But, you know, the conversions continue. Wow. And the healing miracles around um, her continue. And, you know, even during the time of the tr the so-called troubles, right, uh, the Cristeros, you know, there she was at the center of everything. And, of course, she's uh, the mother of Christ, the mother of us, the mother of our America, and uh, she is mother par excellence, so to say the least. And so, um, uh, you know, and just uh, the beauty of her face, mm -hmm. you know, I, I used to be able to see uh, quite intoxicating, mm. quite intoxicating. And um, and it was there for these Native peoples. They looked at that and just said, wow, you know. How many years after Our Lady of Guadalupe appeared to Juan Diego did they cease doing human sacrifice in it Mexico? It didn't take long. I think it gave such credibility to the church uh, and the origin, the image of the image story gave such um, credibility to the church. This is way before they discovered the miraculous nature of the tilma. Um, it was um, uh, maybe like two th decades, and it's done with. Wow. Yeah, I mean, it was absolutely done with. So, I Our mean, Lady of Guadalupe, pray for America. Oh. We have our own human sacrifice. We need to yes, we end do. here. Yes, dear Lord and dear Mary, please help us. And I agree with that completely. She, if anyone can turn this Holocaust around, it is she. Mm. Where should we go next, Lords or Fatima? Oh, I'll take <laughs> Fatima because um, I think she has a role to play in helping the oh, West. Yeah. And oh, the by church the way, the I forgot to mention one thing about the stars on the cope, you know, the mantle of mm. Our Lady. Um, you know, uh, I'll just make it real quick because I know we should get to Fatima. But the main thing is that on that mantle, if you kind of, uh, you know, d look at the star placement and then you sort of, uh, you know, use computers again to um, make the, uh, the, uh, uh, the image straight so that it looks like it's, you know, got a, uh, you know, an X and a Y axis and so forth and so on. Uh, if you look at the star placement, it would be the same as it was on the very day and year of Our Lady's appearance to Juan Diego. It would be the southern sky, mm -hmm. but it's not the southern sky as we would see it looking out. It's like the axis is, is turned 90 degrees, and that is the effect that would happen if the person was outside of our galaxy, as it were, Whoa. looking down... <laughs> from this outer perspective toward what's happening there, that's the stars that are surrounding her. It's the southern sky from the opposite, you know, from uh, outward looking in. Do you and, think God employed an angel? Uh, 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 an angel to... To, <laughs> to uh, paint the tilma for us? 
Well, I think Mary did it. Oh, Mary herself painted I it? I think she just basically... She just dreamed it up. She and... just... Poof. She made it happen according to her own good supernatural power, which she has manifested in many ways. But I wanted to get that cosmological dimension in there because this Fatima miracle, this is something else. All right. Bring it okay. to us, Father. Let's do it. <laughs> okay. Um, Time gonna, and place. Uh, okay. First, uh, we're dealing with, uh, well, I'll start maybe with um, July 17th, um, 1917. So we'll start there just for a second. We're in the middle of World War I, remember, this bloodletting, horrible war. And, and so um, Mary comes to these three uh, children um, in uh, Portugal and uh, she, they're, they're basically shepherd children. They're peasants. They're uneducated. Uh, Lucia, of course, is, you know, um, a kind of the main, the younger main kind of character in it. Uh, Jacinta, of course, has a, a, a role, and Francisca has a role. But the main thing, though, to, to see is that uh, there are a lot of things, you know, that happen on July the 12th. One thing to keep your, uh, your eye on is the fact that she says to all three of them, something important is going to happen. There is going to be a miracle of real, you know, supernatural proportions that will be very noticeable that will happen. And then, of course, she goes on uh, to describe what's going to happen on October 17th, 1917. Um, and she says it's going to happen at when the sun is at its high point in the sky. Now, normally, that would be noon when the sun is at the high point. But the Portuguese government mandated that because, you know, Portuguese soldiers were fighting in France, that all the clocks in Portugal, in sympathy with their soldiers in France, should be moved to French time. Wow. So it was moved to 2 o'clock. So essentially, the high point in the sky is not 12, it's 2. So, okay, so this is July 12th. And then um, uh, the, um, uh, you know, Lucy announces this and the word goes out like wildfire. You know, she's had an appearance of the Blessed Virgin Mary and this is going to happen and so forth and so on. So the authorities arrest her, uh, basically. <laughs> How old is she? Uh, seven or I think just seven years old. So so <laughs> quick back up here. So yeah. these are shepherd effectively peasant children peasant. like you said Uneducated, and they yeah. she gets arrested because the authorities found out that there's something that kooky going on and we just want to yeah. put a stop to it put a stop to it and because so, it might spread superstition among the people was this a catholic authority uh no it was, was it? basically portuguese secular authority okay a police authority why did they care so much putting to because putting an end it to the was generating religious interest ah. and it was in the interests of the secular authorities to make sure right that uh she was shut up because they didn't want any more cultivation of re religious uh, you know Got devotion it. So anyway, because it might be a threat to their power if the that, peasants are too that's religiously right. motivated, they might not be as in line with whatever the secularist in power wanted them to do. Exactly, mm -hmm. and so um, to make a long story short, uh, what winds up happening is she had mentioned to somebody, "Well, uh, Blessed Virgin Mary told us to come back on August 17th. So they thought, "No, you're not." So they arrest her, and of course, but then she zeroes in. And comes back, I think it might have been the 19th or the 20th, don't quote me on those dates. Uh, but she does go back to the grotto again and has the, um, uh, you know, the Blessed Virgin does appear to her um, and says, I'm telling you, October 17th is going to happen, so get ready. I'm sorry, October 13th. I, 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 if I said 17th, I meant October 13th, 1917. But anyway, so on October 13th. So uh, she says, once again, I'm going to, it's going to happen. So come back on September the 13th. So she comes back on September the 13th. And sure enough, the Blessed Virgin Mary says a third time, get ready, October 13th, you know, sun is at its highest eight, uh, point in the sky. It's going to happen again. So how many 13s were there before the miracle of the sun? Well, the, the first one was July 13th. Then there was supposed to be one for August 13th, but it wound up being whatever it was, the 19th by the time she could get out there. 
then so our lady waited for her waited for her absolutely as it were mm -hmm. and then september the 13th it happens and then of course october the 13th rolls around well by that time the word had gotten out and people were flowing into the grotto and i mean they were not just flow i mean it was like 40,000 people i mean we're talking about a lot of witnesses here and there were people of every stripe, right? There were scientists that were there, medical doctors that were there. There were lawyers that were there. There were investigative reporters that were there. In fact, the head of the Masonic newspaper had been saying, well, we're finally going to get some proof of the fraud of the Catholic Church and this nonsense about the Blessed Virgin Mary. I'm going out there myself to disprove this. Uh, so uh, you can uh, be sure that I'll be publishing the day after of uh, October 13th, I'm going to be publishing uh, the results uh, here of what didn't happen at the grotto. So of course, uh, he goes out there along with the other 40,000. Some people estimate the crowd to be 50 or 60,000. But I'm going to take just a lower estimate just fine. 40,000 is more than enough witnesses. So it's been raining all day, and people are really interested. They're looking for a reason to believe, and so they go out there. And then, um, as I said, they stand out there in the rain, and this will be important in a moment, and uh, everything is soaking wet on the ground. The clothes are soaking wet of the people that are there. And, of course, Lucy comes out on the shoulders of a, a big man, and she's kind of like steering him and, you know, uh, you know, uh, riding him out there. And uh, so she gets out there and um, uh, right around, you know, what would have been um, the equivalent of about, I guess, 130-ish or so. And then finally, as uh, the, you know, as things are moving toward 2 o'clock, you know, the apex of the, the uh, high point of the sun, um, all of a sudden, Lucy goes, look at the sun. And of course, right at that moment, all of a sudden you can see that the sun, it looks like the sun has turned, you know, like this beautiful translucent color with a silver rim around it. And it looks like it's, it's almost uh, rotating on its own axis, you know, and, and just spinning there, uh, you know, in this translucent, beautiful silver rim. And of course, everybody is looking up at this. This will be very important momentarily. But it's not damaging their eyes. They're able to behold the sun. It's not damaging their retinas. Unbelievable. You can, uh, there are photographs. Like, I mean, dozens and dozens of photographs of everybody looking up there at the sun. They're all riveted on this thing. And no and one... And it's still raining. It's, uh, is it no, still raining? Oh, I'm sorry. The rain stops and then the sun is exposed. And then, of course, it starts spinning just like that. And then all of a sudden, it, it, it starts kind of dancing. They call it dancing. The sun starts dancing in the sky. It's going forward, then backward, then forward, then backward. Almost like it's, it's moving, uh, you know, forward and backward. And people are just awed uh, by what's going on. And then all of a sudden, it's almost like it, it begins to, uh, to uh, refract, you know, all kinds of colors of every kind. So like big red rays will be coming out and then blue rays will be coming out. But what's so interesting is you can uh, see that these rays are basically turning the ground and people's faces blue or yellow or orange or red, whatever the ray is that's near uh, by uh, them. And so then, the, 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 you know, again, uh, totally inexplicable. Then the sun literally detaches from the place where it is, and it comes roaring in uh, to the grotto. And when it comes roaring into the grotto, everybody is down, you know, on, either on their faces, on their knees, you get pictures all over the place of people just falling down simultaneously, uh, you know, and of course, repenting uh, of their sins right then and there. In fact, uh, uh, there's some humorous anecdotes of people confessing their sins in front of everybody. But uh, the main thing is, uh, is that this happens um, and everybody sees it. And when the sun is approaching them, it's drying, drying off 
uh, all of the uh, people's clothes and drying off the ground, right? Uh, I mean, a mass hallucination cannot do this. A mass hallucination cannot prevent retinal um, you know, uh, um, uh, you know, decomposition from looking at the sun for ten full minutes. I mean, you, you just your your retinas are dead on arrival. I mean, so the, there are all kinds of ver validatable um, ways of verifying that this actually did happen, as it was described by these forty thousand witnesses. By the way, no witnesses are saying that it didn't happen. And if in case anybody's thinking that there's mass hallucination going on here, I just remember. Uh, for a second here, that there are people who are 10 minutes, I mean, 10 uh, miles away. Uh, just exactly how did the mass uh, hallucination <laughs> communicate to the people there that were 10 miles away who saw the same thing? So people who were not at the grotto saw the same thing? Absolutely, who are within about, a, some people say within a 20-mile perimeter, some wow. for sure a 10-mile perimeter, so just use the concern. How many of these 40,000 people were interviewed or wrote down their firsthand accounts of what happened? Uh, there were a lot of them. A lot of those, you know, a lot of them dispersed, but a lot of them were tracked down. People, you know, uh, definitely got interviews. There were a huge, the, the database on the Fatima interview is very large indeed. And, and did they, many of them convert? I mean, the, the Masonist uh, guy, oh, the Mason guy. Uh, great question. So what did they think about what that? What is in the front page uh, this is the main Mason, and that is to say, because the Masons were so popular in Portugal at that time, it was one, one of the, the major uh, newspapers, but it, it was the main Mason newspaper, which is a major newspaper in Portugal. What's in the front headline? The sun dances at Fatima. The guy literally converted. Wow. Turned right around and said, I to cannot explain this. Well... As far as I know, he converted all the way to Catholicism, but I certainly know he absolutely admitted, yes, the sun danced in the sky at Fatima. I saw it. There's no denying it. And I know he had a definite change of heart. Um, Dr. St uh, Father Stanley Yaki is also a first-rate physicist, by the way, J-A-K-I. Um, and he is, uh, uh, wrote a book called um, uh, the, sun, uh, the Miracle of the Sun at Fatima, I believe it was mm -hmm. called, or maybe uh, uh, The Sun at Fatima, I forget what it is. But if you just look up Stanley um, Yaki, uh, just uh, take a look at that book. Also, I've got three other books I can recommend where there's photographs and various things that you can see of the people all looking at the sun and so forth. But anyway, then the sun comes all the way down, dries everybody's clothes in the ground, zooms back up into place, circles a few more times, and stops. Now you think, wow, you call up all the other observatories around the world. This is, it must have, uh, you know, done something, uh, you know, to, everybody should have seen it. Well, call up, uh, they did it right away. All the astronomers who were there call up the observatories all around the world. No, uh, nothing special has happened. So how can you explain this then? If it wasn't a solar phenomenon, what was it? Clearly, it has to be an atmospheric phenomenon. Now, a lot of physicists have studied this, and I'll get you some of the books of those physicists. But the main thing to remember is, I'm going to just get, there's, I've written a whole, this, I wrote a new book with Ignatius, Christ, Science, and Reason. Just go to um, chapter five of that book. Uh, it just came out two weeks ago. Just go to chapter five of that book, and you'll see all the various causes people have tried to explain. It doesn't even come close. There's only one cause that can possibly explain it. There has to be a gigantic lens that is positioned, you know, somewhere maybe about 20 miles above the grotto. But this gigantic lens, you know, would almost have to be like a mile in diameter. Right. And, and of course, it would have to have everything in place so that when it spins on its own axis, it could refract this light and, and, you know, specific colors would emerge. And then it would have to, you know, be able to detach from its place, you know, maybe 10, maybe 20 miles from uh, the grotto and then zoom down 
uh, to within a half a mile. Aliens. Of, uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> aliens. Yeah, that's what it was. Uh, except uh, I guess the aliens were talking to Lucy, too. The aliens but must the, love Mama Mary because yeah. they're doing her bidding right now. That's right, because they were identifying themselves as Mary. Mm-hmm. So anyway, the long and the short uh, of the thing is is, is that um, the lens would have to detach, come right down, dry everything off, and zoom back uh, into the skies. So mm-hmm. Stanley Yockey, uh, he's a very creative physicist. He says, okay. He says, um, now, if that happened and it was a supernatural lens, that was up there, that would be a miracle. And then he says, could this possibly be explained by a natural phenomenon? So he pieces together, well, suppose there's ice crystals up there, and suppose you have a very unique boomerang configuration of these winds, you know, blowing forward and backward. Suppose you have this and that. Ice crystals where? uh, Oh, that are blowing in the sky. So it's the Ah, ice crystals (laughs) that are inside that are refracting them. So he's trying to build the case for the naturalist. He just says, let me do it for you, right? Uh, You know, maybe you could get a big, huge ice lens you know, that's out there, and it was of natural configuration. Now, the odds of an ice lens like that forming uh, by pure um, natural hap- happenstance are like 10 to the uh, uh, 60th or something, 70th to 1 against. Uh, now, uh, 10 to the 70th, that, that's a really big number. Uh, that's like <laughs> a trillion, 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 trillion. That's a miracle yeah, that, if that happens. Well, like not that. only that, but imagine this. Remember, Lucy predicted this uh, going to happen on October 13th mm-hmm. at this precise time in this precise place. She predicted it three times. No question about it. Everybody heard it. They knew to, where to go. 40,000 people knew where to go. So the, the main thing is, what are the odds that this totally trillion, 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 you know, against uh, odds, all odds phenomenon would happen at all, let alone happen on October 13th at 2 o'clock p.m. when the sun is at its apex uh, at exactly the place where Mary had said that it would happen. That is about 10 to about the 1,300 to 1, which is 1,300, like a trillion, 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 trillion. You should have the, this number with all of the zeros written up right here. If it would fit, it won't fit. It won't yeah, fit. Yeah, it's about the same as a, as a monkey typing the first two <laughs> uh, uh, acts of Macbeth uh, by random tapping of the keys perfectly in a single try. I'm not kidding you. That's, that's the odds of wow. this happening, which means, as you pointed out, it's a miracle. So, I mean, it's definite. Whatever way you want to do, Yaki says, I'll build the natural case for you. Here's the one way it can really happen. I'll make it all work. And it's still a miracle. What was so, the message? What was the message of Our Lady of Fatima? Well, it was a kind of a threefold message. Uh, the first one is Our Lady wanted, she had, had these three secrets. And one of the secrets was uh, she showed the children a vision of hell. And you might think to yourself, well, gee, why would Mary show the children a vision of hell? Because she wants the the, she wanted these children to know that, you know, there is your spiritual enemy is out there. And he's a very crafty spiritual enemy. And he seduces you into thinking that you'll be much happier if you don't follow the teaching of Jesus, her son than if you did follow the teaching of Jesus. And so, of course, uh, that spiritual enemy wants to seduce you where? Oh, he'll say you get lots of power and domination and all kinds of narcissistic sensorial pleasures. You're just going to be filled with every kind of thing. It's going to be so great down there in hell. But of course, the, the, the main thing is, mm. Mary says, here's what's happening in hell. And she shows these children this vision. And, you, and I think the fact that the children get the vision, right, who are not overly inclined to be thinking about hell along those lines, they come back and say, well, world, you should be aware of this. By the way, God doesn't have to send anybody to hell. We choose hell just fine by believing all of the seductions and lies and deceits of our spiritual enemy, the evil spirit. And the point, of course, is Portugal is going secular. Portugal is believing 
uh, you know, the Kool-Aid that is being served up right now in our culture. All the sex you want, just think of it. It's going to be one big party. So Drugs, sexual hedonism uh, was, the, exactly. was one of the messages of the time that the secularists were pushing, and it was directly opposed to the Christian values of the people. And also the power seduction, too. You know, hey, you're the smartest, you're the brightest, you deserve, you owe it to yourself. All the power you can get at whatever expense you have to do it. And by the way, bust up all the hope of the little people here, you know, by, by uh, taking a, a misusing science to say this or that. Trust me, you'll be dominating, leading them around by the nose soon. Isn't it great that all these secularists, they turn out to be the new gods themselves, right? This was I, before the Second World War, right? This is first, so, right in the middle of the, the First, the World, first World, War. World War. Or toward the end of there the was, First World War. One of her messages was about Russia's errors. Yep. Why is that significant? This is the beginning well, because, of the 20th century, bloodiest uh, century in human history. And of course, you know, of course, 1917 Russian Revolution, right? And uh, the whole idea is it's not just World War I that's going on. Russia's going to have this revolution. And at the time, you look at this little party called the Bolsheviks and you think, this, this is not going to be a big deal. But Mary's prediction is this is going to be a horrible secular society. And when she's saying that, it, it'll, it's worse than anyone can imagine that it will be. It'll be worse for the Russian people. And we know after the Stalinist purges and the Stalinist I mean, truly, the, this was a genocide of the Ukrainians, genocide of whole population groups. I mean, this was... An so immis- why is, sorry to interrupt, but yeah. why is Mary predicting effectively to these children in Portugal bad stuff that Russia is going to do in the decades to come? Ask them to pray and to pray especially for the conversion of Russia mm-hmm. because it's going to be, World War One as bad as it is, the Spanish flu epidemic, as bad as it was, right? Um, it's it's bad, but this influence is going to bring you know uh, our world a, a whole new secular era, and besides that, a real threat to the rest of the world. And so, should uh, Christians sh- be praying for Russia now? Yes, I I think so. I mean, was was her kind of prediction, our Blessed Mother's prediction in Fatima to the children about Russia's errors. Obviously, you have the um, Stalinists and you have all of the tremendous persecution of Christians and the gulag Mm -hmm. and all of the death and destruction Mm -hmm. that came with that, right? Right. And then you have the falling of the, you know, you have overall the end of the Cold War. Boris Yeltsin standing on the tank, just ushering a whole new age. The decline of the Soviet uh, Socialist Republic. Gorbachev actually tear you know, down this wall. Uh, t- well, then Kennedy. Yeah, I, I mean uh, uh, Reagan uh, uh, saying tear down this wall, and and uh, so much uh, uh, you know uh, uh, other uh, you know tremendous other things that are happening. But I mean, literally, all of the predictions. You know what would happen? We were praying at Mass for the conversion of Russia for many, many years. But is you know, it is it conver- is she converted? I guess my question is: Yes, you know the wall came down. Yes, there's much more freedom throughout, you know, yeah. Eastern Europe. But and you know, many of these countries are now sovereign again that were part mm-hmm. of the Soviet Union. But you now have well, Russia churches, invading Ukraine. You yeah. still have you know a super high abortion rate in Russia. You have the abuses that are happening in Russia. Is there is long, it ongoing? Yeah, long-lasting effects of sin. But notice three things are happening. The first thing is um, the churches are being reopened mm. in Russia. Now, of course, as you know, churches were destroyed, and m- many churches will never be reconstructed and reopened. But they are reopening, and new churches are being built. What's interesting, when I, I, I was visiting uh, in Russia uh, myself, I was doing some talks at the St. Petersburg Institute there on uh, Catholic social teaching and, and ethics and so forth to the Russian Orthodox Church. And I met with the seminarians. I mean, they couldn't get enough of me. Uh, literally, uh, they would come to my room at like three in the morning, ding, 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 <laughs> and they go, oh, we got five questions. <laughs> three in the morning, you know, oh, well, that's the only time we can ask you. We're just seminarians. And all the dignitaries can ask you the official questions, but we can't. So, okay, 
you know, they get out of bed, go over to their classroom. These are Orthodox seminarians? Yeah, they were. Yeah, and they were just the loveliest people. Uh, I, but also, I got myself over, um, I asked those Orthodox seminaries, said, hey, take me over to the Roman Catholic seminary. And they did. Uh, they they took me over there, and I I, I only could meet with the superior. He, one, he was a Jesuit. I could only meet with the superior there, but the main thing is, is um, the uh, the seminaries were out doing things when I got over there. Mm. But the main thing, anyway, is that uh, uh, it's they're getting vocations, mm. and you know they're taking up this responsibility. I mean, one of the questions, you know, um, the, the seminarians ask, you know, because during the, the sessions they go, "How do you make sure all these companies are ethical and is, and do all the things?" I said, "Well, one way." Is that we have ethics ethics ratings, you know, um, you know, and uh, uh, people, you know, we have better business bureau ratings, and we got these guys, and these seminarians look at me and they go, "Oh, you could never have them here." Remember, we're up to our elbows in blood. Whoever was the ethicist who said that this company was bad, that that guy's toast, right? He, he's he's not going to make it another day uh, because we don't, um, you know, people. If you make an enemy here. You know, as they say, our, our, you know, arms are up to our elbows in, in blood. So the, the idea is, you know, they said, that won't work. What's another way, you know, <laughs> we could uh, make this happen? And, of course, I said, it has to be a long-lasting solution. But the revitalization of religion, and that is mm -hmm. also not just the Russian Orthodox religion, but also the Roman Catholic religion, there has to be some form of allowing people some uh, freedom of religion. Is that the takeaway message of Fatima, that we need to safeguard the faith, have a, a revitalization in our own souls, in our own families, in our own nations, whether it's Russia or another nation, would that be the core message? You got it. I mean, you are right on the marker because that's the whole reason for the showing hell to the kids, right? Mm -hmm. It's also the reason um, for, um, you know, uh, praying for Russia because it's the whole idea of you have to safeguard religion in yourself, safeguard religion um, and, you know, relationship with God and mm -hmm. fidelity to God's moral teaching in the family. You have to safeguard it in the community, right? And even in the big, huge polis, the city-state, or even in the state itself. So the, the safeguarding of religion is everywhere to be found um, in the Fatima miracle. And, and I think, as I said before, you know, it's not just belief in Jesus and Mary, I mean, by the way, if you don't think Mary's real after this, uh, you know, effort, I'm begging you, read my book, Christ, Science, and Reason. Just read chapter five. And how else are you going to explain this? Mm. I mean, if she didn't appear to Lucy, how could Lucy ever make this prediction? How could this miracle of the sun ever have happened? You know, et cetera, et cetera. I, I totally, you, you don't have to believe in this as a Catholic. You simply don't have to believe it. But I have to say, just as a reasonable, responsible thinking guy, I have to say, you know, it's irresistible to think, you know, I think the Blessed Virgin Mary was not just atmospherically, <clears throat> but cosmically present. And this, you know, replication of the, uh, of the sun through this gigantic lens and so forth and so on. I think she was right there going, I'm here. What's so and fascinating is she looks different. She looks very different. Our Lady of Fatima than Our Lady of Guadalupe. Guadalupe. Yeah, no, she appears um, in in the form of the uh, country, and the same thing with Our Lady of Lourdes. Looks different from Our Lady of Fatima and looks different from Our Lady of Guadalupe. And, you know, different clothing, <clears throat> you know. Why she, is that? Why do you think Our Lady changes she, her wardrobe and even her appearance, her physical features for these different apparitions. So that the people uh, who are witnessing it will identify with her immediately. It's like Bernadette of Subiru, right, at, at Lourdes. You know, all she can say, she looks at her and thinks, this is a beautiful lady, right? You know, she doesn't mm -hmm. quite have the idea that this could be the Blessed Virgin Mary. And of course, everybody's prodding her, prodding her, you know, ask her if she's the Blessed Virgin Mary. So finally, of course, Bernadette musters up her courage, and uh, um, she, you know, she says, "Well, well, everybody wants to know who you are." She goes, "Immaculata Conceptu." Wow. Which means, you know, I'm 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 the uh, Immaculate Conception. Wow. Of course, Bernadette had no idea what those words meant. Zero. 
I mean, <clears throat> so she just said, I repeated it three times <laughs> so I could know exactly, uh, say it exactly as she told me. And of course, she was interrogated like 27 times. All right. So we're going to do Lord's last because okay. this is our last apparition to cover. And you just, you gave us the teaser. Oh, okay. Very good. Well, <clears throat> 1854, of course, uh, Our Lady appears. Um, you know, I, I'll, I'll skip some of the details of the story. She's out there, uh, you know, by a very, you know, a grotto that is used for the burning of trash, but it was probably some kind of a pagan, uh, you know, place of worship. And it's, you know, all kinds of demonic things are going on over there and so forth and so on. But Bernadette's there looking for cords and, you know, sticks of wood for her family's fire. And um, as she's there with two of her uh, friends, uh, Jean Abadie, and of course her sister, uh, she's um, sitting there and they go off looking for um, uh, some wood. And uh, Bernadette, she can't cross the river because she has terrible asthma. And so getting her feet wet in icy cold water um, right in, in uh, the winter would have been really terrible. So she anyway, she's just uh, looking there and waiting for uh, uh, Jean Abadie and her sister to return. And all of a sudden, this beautiful lady appears in front of this grotto. When she appears in front of the grotto, she's amazed. And she's thrown into this ecstasy. Um, when she sees her, she's just riveted uh, uh, to her. And she is in a complete state of rapture. Um, and she's looking and she's kneeling on the ground. Uh, in front of this beautiful woman. Was she and, life like the size of a normal human woman? He, oh, uh, maybe just larger. a little bit bigger. Uh, but she had roses between her feet and she was looked like she was slightly elevated above mm -hmm. the ground. Uh, but she looked more or less like a, a b beautiful woman in beautiful clothes. Anyway, um, she's there. And, um, you know, uh, as she goes into the rapture, I mean... Uh, uh, Bernadette does, um, her friends come back and they go, you know, Bernadette, what kind of nonsense are you up to? Get up here and help us with these twigs <laughs> and or these uh, pieces of wood. And so, so Jean Abadie actually throws a rock which barely misses her head, you know, and throws it right at um, her, uh, I think it hit her in the shoulder or the back. Mary. It, yeah. No, no, hit, hit it, uh, uh, Bernadette. They couldn't uh, see Mary. They couldn't but see only Mary. But only Bernadette could see Mary. Only Bernadette could see Mary. And, of course, she's still in the rapture. And finally, of course, you know, they begin to, to sense, are you okay? Is everything okay? So, of course, the sister goes roaring home and so forth, you know, and the, you know, and the mother's coming out and trying to, you know, uh, revive her. And this uh, one, Antoine Nicolo, uh, he basically has to carry her uh, you know, away, you know, in this state of rapture because she's just not moving, uh, basically. But she finally, when she comes out of it uh, at the home of Antoine and his mother, uh, she says, you know, well, I saw this beautiful woman. And, and uh, um, you know, uh, Antoine is just stupefied. He said, I've never seen anything like this in, before in my whole life, you know. Um, you know, a little Bernadette who he knew, you know, and a little kid, you know, there. And she still is kind of a little kid. But uh, the, the long and the short of it is that uh, this happens several different times. And, you know, despite herself, her parents try to, you know, um, excuse it and demand that she not go to the grotto. And the, then the secular authorities get involved in this. And when they get involved in this, they start threatening her and try to uh, do all kinds of things. Uh, I'll just cut to the chase. Uh, basically, she, uh, um, um, you know, has this huge group, like 5,000 people who are coming to the grotto because, you know, when she moves into this ecstasy, literally this uh, Dr. Dozus, uh, he, he basically takes a, like a wick. Uh, you know, she's got a candle in her hand and he takes the candle and he puts it underneath her hand and she doesn't even flinch when she's in this ecstasy and of course he he is a person who has a specialty in uh, you know nerve physiology and so he uh, he just said this you know 
this is really uh, impossible. I mean, yes, maybe you have some Indian guy who could do a fire walk or something like that, but this girl has never been trained in any such thing. She's in this ecstasy, and she did the feels, flame burn her hand? Uh, well, actually, it did not, and that was the second part where Dozus goes, "Hey." This is not normal. So he put a flame under her hand when she's in ecstasy, beholding Our Lady. There's thousands of people watching. It would not burn her hand, and she wouldn't flinch. She wouldn't even notice that it yep, was there. That is correct. Incredible. That's exactly what happened. And so, of course, this goes on. The number of the crowds go up. Then, of course, the secular authorities go, oh, no. Now we're going to get more religious revitalization uh, here in France. We've just become enlightened. By the way, there is a, a very good... Um, uh, story that was written. It was a, by a Jewish fellow, um, you know, who was trying to escape um, a Nazi Germany and had been going through Lourdes. And he promises, he says, if there's anything, <clears throat> if you get me out of here, um, Lord, uh, and and uh, and there's something to this story, just get me out of here and I will write it up. And Franz Werfel was his name, and he was very important. Uh, you know, German writer uh, who was being hunted by the Nazis. But anyway, um, he uh, writes it up um, uh, later because, of course, he does get out with his family uh, out of uh, uh, Nazi Europe and then writes it up right away. It's a great book. It's called The, the Song of Bernadette. There's a movie called The Song of Bernadette. You can also get the book by Werfel is excellent. He researched this thing like someone, you know, mad with devotion. What was the so, historical context here, Father Spitzer, mm -hmm. of the apparition of Our Lady of Lourdes? Oh, yeah. Because we're talking of France, and what year are we talking? Uh, oh, this is uh, 1854. So, you know, you've got this emperor who's... Remember that you've had this mm -hmm. terrible French re revolution, terrible secularization of France, terrible persecution of the church, beheading all these sisters and priests and everything mm -hmm. from the guillotine, just terrible things that have happened. Well, anyway, Napoleon comes and says, get rid of that deal, uh, where, you know, um, he ends all the, um, you know, the remnants of the French Revolution. I mean, the reign of terror was so horrible that the French people actually ended that themselves. But the main thought is that um, you've got this, uh, I think he's the nephew of Napoleon uh, Bonaparte, and um, uh, he's also called uh, uh, Napoleon, um, oh, is this a second name? But anyway, he's uh, the uh, successor, I guess, and a third successor to Napoleon Bo Bonaparte. But he is, uh, you know, uh, a secularist himself. He wants to protect the secularist uh, government. So, of course, he approves through his uh, administration the closing of the grotto. Of course, this gets a lot of people angry. Oh, Where's Bernadette at this point? Okay, Bernadette is just living in this little town of Lourdes. And so this is her special meeting place with the Blessed Mother, and he's like, we're shutting it down. We're shutting her down. What was uh, the What was the message, by the way, that Our Lady would give to Bernadette? Any messages, or well, she would just appear to her? at this point, and there's not a message coming out. She's just praying. So the Blessed Virgin Mary goes out there and prays with her. But eventually, there is the message of repentance, mm. repentance, repentance. There is the message, you know, that you return to God <clears throat> and, uh, you know, uh, be, you know, re repent. That means metanoia, change your heart. That comes out again and again. That's and always again. the message, Pray it sounds the, like, of, the, oh, of all of Our Lady's apparitions. It's return to Jesus. Return to repent. Jesus, repent. And, of course, also doing the rosary. Mm is very important as well, you know, and a variety of other things. Mm. But the main thing is, at this point, um, you know, there's not even uh, 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 any Lourdes water, which will be, become known as miraculous water. And so there is no um, uh, sense that this <coughs> exists. What happens is that Our Lady just says, oh, go and drink some water from over there in that corner of the cave. And Bernadette goes over there, but there's no water there. And so she digs and digs and digs, and finally she finds a little bit of water that's in, in, embedded in the soil. And so she kind of eats this soil and thinks that's what the Blessed Virgin Mary wants her to do. Everybody laughs at her, and nobody appears at the next um, uh, apparition because they think that she's crazy. But what happens, of course, is two of the people who were there began to notice 
a slow trickle that's literally emerging throughout the rills of the stone, right? There's a slow trickle of water that's beginning to emerge. And of course, uh, one of the guys who's there, uh, you know, applies it to his eyes <clears throat> and he gets a partial recovery of his sight. And so, of course, some other people start becoming interested in it. And then, of course, uh, you know, these um, uh, um, miners, um, you know, they, they really good work with their hands and, and uh, they were a very good tradesman. Um, <clears throat> they were collected by this guy. Remember uh, Antoine Nicolo? Uh, he, uh, he actually sees the trickle of the water, too. He hears the report that there's water coming out of this stone and there's, it's going throughout the rills. And so uh, he looks at it and he's a very good tradesman and has a relationship with all of these other guys who are basically stone crafters and stone miners and so forth and so on. He gets all these guys together and they go out there in the middle of the night and they start tracking where the water's coming from. And then of course they make a little channel for the water to, to go through. And then they just open up the little hole from which the, um, the water is emerging and it starts pouring out into this channel. So he's created this like wooden channel that's <clears throat> bringing everything into a huge basin. Uh, and these guys crafted it. And uh, so all of a sudden, <clears throat> Bernadette was totally vindicated, right? Here is the water that Our Lady was pointing to. Nobody had ever known about it as being in the grotto. And she just, of course, when this happens, <clears throat> everybody's back at the grotto and the miracles right away. Do we know how many miracles have been recorded in connection to the healing waters of Lourdes? Well, um, there's two kinds of recording. <clears throat> the first kind is the one that's recorded by the uh, Lourdes Medical Commission. Um, and so mm -hmm. those miracles... They're about 7,000. 7,000 miracles from yes. the waters of Lourdes. But the true number is closer to 10 times that number, wow. around 70,000. And the reason for that is because you have to go through a whole procedure. Once you go to the Lourdes Medical Bureau, uh, um, or the now they call it the, you know, the Office of Investigation, but the main thing is once you go there, it's a long process. You have to bring up all your records, um, you know, of being checked previously, <laughs> then there has to be follow-up with you. You have, you know, a week to two weeks of examination by all the doctors at the Lourdes Medical Bureau. Then you have to have at least 10 years of follow-up, make sure that the cure has taken and so forth. Most people just, they get cured. And, and they say, thank you. <laughs> and they like, say, thank you when they I'm go I'm going to enjoy this. Yeah, I mean, I have a dear friend yeah. uh, who was cured of significant life-threatening mental health mm -hmm. issues in Lourdes, from mm -hmm. the healing waters of Lourdes. Oh, yeah. In fact, and I, I know, I mean, people listening, you might have a story, let me know in the comments, but there's so many stories oh, of oh, yeah. healings, miraculous healings, oh, physical, yeah. mental healings, emotional, even healings from Lourdes. Mm -hmm. yeah, we know a lady, uh, you know, who uh, actually uh, had a terrible edema, um, in her legs because a, a kid had kind of run over mm. her in a, a, a crosswalk and, uh, you know, her legs had swollen to, you know, twice the normal size. It had created uh, terrible problems with walking. She, she had to use her husband's shoes uh, to get around and so forth. And um, uh, anyway, the, uh, uh, she goes to Lourdes and um, she, you know, gets put in the bath and then she comes out, um, no effect. So I think she's just leaving the scene. Um, other people know this um, better than me, but as she's leaving the scene, um, she takes out her medicines to try and get some relief from the edema. And um, the, uh, uh, I think somebody tells her, uh, you know, uh, well, are you going to trust in the miracle? or not trust in the miracle. And uh, she thinks about it for a second. She tosses her medicine mm -hmm. and walks away. And as she's doing that, after she has displayed the trust, as she's doing it, those big, huge shoes of her husband start flopping on her feet. And her mm -hmm. legs literally start becoming normal size wow. as she's walking away. <laughs> And this uh, lady right here in Orange County, 
um, you know, maybe even we got to get her on the show. Get her on the show. I'll oh ask my gosh. if she's interested. In, praise the Lord. Um, praise Jesus yeah. Christ. I better not say. I'll tell you her first name. But all right, you, you tell me after her. this. Yeah, and then wow, um, Father Spitzer. Yeah, it's but I mean, this have is you like, been to Lords? Oh yes, wow. I have. But uh, you we know, we got to do a pilgrimage. Oh. Get a bunch of sick people and I'll come oh, and get you. You, you can't it's amazing. believe. Oh, it's this, amazing. Is your Lords is your favorite, right? You uh, said, you said that, I do you love said Lords earlier. because uh, <laughs> the reason I love Lords is just having been there at the candlelight processions, one after the next, after the next, in the middle of the grotto. Mm. It was so unbelievably supernatural what was going on there. I just felt like, I mean, I, I loved Fatima and I've visited mm. Fatima and I, I very much love it, but. I have to tell you, there's something at Lourdes that is so special. I mean, if you even if you don't get a cure, and mm. uh, because you just know, in a sense, it's God's will. But anyway, to finish off Bernadette, there she she basically uh, you know uh, has gets this great notoriety, and of course at that point, the, oh, the secular authorities have got everything closed off. They don't want this revitalization of religion. Uh, in France, and it's making the papers everywhere, you know, that this has gone on, that this water was discovered, that this water has miraculous properties. And so, of course, um, it comes to the attention of the wife of Louis Napoleon. He's the third generation, not third generation, but third, uh, yeah, generation ancestor of, uh, of uh, um, Napoleon Bonaparte, the nephew, I, think, I believe. So anyway, um, his wife, who is uh, again, this uh, uh, a wonderful Catholic woman. I think she was from Corsica originally. But uh, anyway, uh, he has married her, loves her very much. And she goes, Louis, you know, <laughs> um, you know, we should, uh, their, their boy had had, uh, you know, a bout of uh, a strep, which could have been uh, like even scarlet fever. And so she was very, very worried. So to make a long story short, she goes and asks her friend, uh, who is, uh, you know, sitting with, um, uh, you know, Louis Napoleon's son, um, and uh, Lulu is what his name was. And so she says, you know, hey, can you get me some of this Lord's water? Well, of course, it was strictly forbidden for anyone to go there. But, you know, this was the wife of the head of the French Navy. Uh, nobody knew it, but she just went over there and tried to sneak some water out of the, uh, of the, basin out of the grotto and boom she's arrested and she's dragged before um you know the the magistrate uh there and uh you know to uh you know to suffer the the consequences and so he says your name please and of course she gives the name he goes oh you know there's someone of great fame here that is my husband oh your husband <laughs> why are you here doing this you know well, <laughs> nice you know. french accent <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i was trying to procure some water for the son of the emperor oh that is impossible you know so of course finally uh um you know he says you are going to have to pay the fine you know so uh she goes i would gladly pay the fine and i would pay 10 times more just give it to the the poor of lords you know <laughs> so Arts, this is going on and uh, you know this challenge is going out you know and of, uh, of course he gives her the water you know but uh, you know that's mm -hmm. you know the water cures the boy amazing so uh, literally Lulu the, the son of uh, Louis Napoleon so to <laughs> make Praise a long story God. short she goes Louis <clears throat> it is very undignified of you to not allow this grotto to be reopened uh, your son is because we do not know dear that the water was the exact agent or the cure of our son you know we do not have to do anything and she goes oh i think it was you know she so goes on and on right you know uh, it, it was you know and so uh, she, using her persuasions finally uh, she gets him to op reopen wow. uh, the grotto and all i can tell you is you know from the literally the source of the water to the miraculous nature of the water to actually the emperor of France getting involved and reopening the grotto mm. by his own signature. I mean, the ironies and the miracles and just working through this little peasant girl. It's hilarious I, I, in a good sense. 
because of course there is despite all of the despotic attempts of these of the <laughs> the emperor the secular administration all, all of a sudden this thing opens up but I just got to tell you about four miracles, uh, <laughs> five miracles that have happened. That you, you just you gotta. You, you All right, we got you. Can you do it? You you had the t you had the out at five fifteen, and it's five thirty. Yes. It's five thirty now. It's five thirty now. Oh, um, I, I can't. Can we save it for another episode? We can save it for another episode, okay. yes. But I want to hear those miracles, so you're gonna get you're gonna have to come back, Father Spitzer. All right. Well, thank you so very much. <laughs> thank Lila. you so much, Father. Okay. This is God, awesome. Well, As usual, you. amazing. God, God bless you. A huge thank you to our partner, EWTN. EWTN is the world's leading Catholic network, reaching millions with the truth about the faith, entertainment, and news. Check them out at EWTN.com.